Welcome to Destination Michigan. We celebrate the people and places that make Michigan a great place to live. Sit back and enjoy tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. Support for Destination Michigan is provided by the CMU Bookstore. T-shirts, sweatshirts, hats, maroon and gold memories, and an official outfitter of Adidas apparel at the Central Michigan University owned and operated CMU Bookstore. Online shopping seven days a week at cmubookstore.com. The CMU Bookstore, online at cmubookstore.com, on campus in the University Center, and game day locations at Kelly Short Stadium and the CMU Events Center. And by Country Smokehouse in Elmont, offering a selection of gourmet meats, including homemade sausage and jerky. Also available, custom catering and weekend outdoor barbecues. Information at countrysmokehouse.com. Tonight on Destination Michigan. It's um, just a beautiful place to visit. And when they see the pictures, they think, let's go see that castle. <laughs> A great American writer grew up in mid-Michigan and built a castle. We'll explore the life of James Oliver Kerwood and visit the Kerwood Castle in Owasso. Well, this is our, the only museum in Michigan solely dedicated to Michigan women's history. We'll celebrate the lives and contributions of amazing Michigan women at the Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame in Lansing. I feel like that work is really powerful and I. I, I love that nobody else is really doing it, so that it's sort of my own special thing. We'll discover the artwork of Shepherd artist Ingrid Taranjo. Tonight on Destination Michigan, I usually don't talk with my mouth full, but these are so good. We're gonna be in Fremont, where we are going to share some of the best breadsticks I've ever eaten with you viewers out there. Mm. Welcome to Destination Michigan. Tonight we'll start off with the story of a great American writer, his love for conservation and the great outdoors, and his castle. Yes, really, he built a castle. His name is James Oliver Kerwood, and he was one of the world's most famous authors in the early 1900s. Kerwood wrote over 30 books and was mentioned in the same breath as Jack London and Zane Grey in the literary world and over half of his books were made into movies. But one of his most impressive achievements still stands tall on the banks of the Shiawassee River in his hometown of Owasso. It's called the Kerwood Castle, and it stands as a living legacy for one of Michigan's all-time great writers. To Owasso we go to write our first chapter of tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. Where does this talent come from? Is it the stories you hear when you're young and you think it should be on paper? Your imagination and you write it down. As soon as he could read and write, his parents realized this will be his life's work. Kerwood was their shining son, the youngest of the family, and I'm sure the parents um, favored him. And yet he had the same bringing up that the others did. Here in Owasso, people knew of him because he was um, kind of a, a different character. He is one of the most famous, you know, native sons to come out of the area. This is a person who uh, the likes of William Randolph Hearst came to Owasso to the castle to see Kerwood, not the other way around. The irony with Kerwood is that he's not well remembered today. The irony behind that is that while he was alive, this is one of the most famous, one of the most influential people in the, in the entire country at the time. He, he was an important figure uh, then, and he is now. I mean, what the words he used then are still really valuable today. The bear is probably his most famous. It was really the grizzly king by title. And it's uh, very sad, but it's, uh, 
from the Beer's point of view, the whole book is told. Another very good one was God's Country and the Woman, Back to God's Country. The series about the dogs is, um, is an outstanding series. That was uh, Kazan, the wolf dog. The Great Lakes is the only one that is not fiction. That book is uh, an outstanding example of his works. How could he ever get all of that information without a computer is beyond me, because it was written in 1916. He also runs into this novelty thing, this thing where they're doing these moving pictures, you know? And Kerwood starts writing uh, screenplays in just an outrageous number. You're gonna find Kerwood films featuring John Wayne, featuring Lon Chaney. These are all, all scripts that uh, are all films based on his scripts. Kerwood Castle has really been a love of mine for many, many years. I came in here as a young child. Being an Owasso native here, or on a farm nearby where I grew up, it was always a big thrill to come into Owasso. This castle was patterned after one that was uh, seen by Mr. Kerwood in France. And it was a Lansing architect that helped to draw the plans for this building. When people come here, they know they're going to see something unique. It is small. It's uh, like going in a fun house. I think it's, uh, it's just a unique building to come and visit. The land, the area that you see around the castle here by the river, was already owned by the family. It was a big deal because it was an unusual structure. I mean, Kerwood had a pretty significant reputation in the community, so that, that wasn't unusual. But when you <laughs> decide to build your office as a castle, you know, um, yeah, that's a little different. He called it a writing studio, and that was his primary focus. He tried to focus the castle as a place of business. Um, contracts were signed out here, uh, frequently signed in this room. Publishers from New York came here frequently. Film producers often came here, uh, that type of thing. And so that's the type of work that usually got done here. There are three turrets technically. One is the one you enter and come through as you come in and you, and you come up the stairs here to what is often referred to as the great room. The main turret obviously is just off his writing area where his desk still sets today. And that goes up uh, two additional levels into the tower and, and again is a pretty scenic way to see the local area. The windows he uh, installed in throughout the tower gave him a wonderful view of, of the local area and the wildlife here. Here in the castle, he could sit and look out the window. He could watch the wildlife. He could watch the river that he so loved. When he talked about being an outdoorsman, he was the real outdoorsman. He loved being out there, and he loved uh, being outside even to do his writing at times. Uh, Governor Green um, tabs him to be a commissioner overseeing uh, conservation issues, you know. He took that to mean, as his Indian friends taught him, that one should take only from nature what they really need to eat. Kerwood said, we're all hunters, we're all hunters, because that's the way God set up the universe. People had to have nourishment, food to eat, and if the vegetables weren't there, <laughs> um, it was necessary to have fish and game to eat for the pioneers in early times, and yet not to take more advantage than we need to. They need to reproduce, and I admire what Mr. Kerwood's work was. It was setting bag limits and season limits for conservation. Up until that time, say 1925, there, there wasn't the organization to set laws for those things. It's just a beautiful place to visit. And when they see the pictures, they think, let's go see that castle. <laughs> it's very comforting to work here. You almost feel the spirit of James Oliver Kerwood when you walk in. 
when I come in and the castle has been closed for several hours, I, I always say, hello, James, I'm here. <laughs> he doesn't answer. If he did, I'd run out the door. To learn more about James Oliver Kerwood and for information on how to take a tour of the Kerwood Castle, you can visit the Facebook page of the Owasso Historical Commission. Our next stop tonight is to our state capitol, where Sarah Adams introduces us to Michigan women who made their mark on the pages of history. To Lansing we go to visit an organization that celebrates the past and also looks to our state's future. In a historic house just off the freeway in Lansing, you'll find the Michigan Women's Historical Center and Hall of Fame. Well, this is our, the only museum in Michigan solely dedicated to Michigan women's history. We have uh, history exhibits that are dedicated to women's stories, and certainly um, we provide the role models for citizens of Michigan to learn about the ways that women have really been pioneers in their fields, the tremendous accomplishments, and we hope to educate everyone in Michigan about what women have accomplished. 260 women's faces stare back at you as you walk through the museum's exhibit space. Some of them are very familiar. The queen of Motown soul, Aretha Franklin. Michigan's first female governor, Jennifer Granholm. Civil rights icon, Rosa Parks. Comic legend, Lily Tomlin. And tennis star, Serena Williams. But what you might not realize is that many of the achievements of the women in these rooms came about because of another group of women who are honored here. Women who dedicated their lives to fighting for women's rights. They were called suffragists. History credits the start of the women's suffrage movement with being a convention in Seneca Falls, New York in 1848. And then things really took off in Michigan from there. There were women from New York that participated in that meeting that then moved to Michigan as part of sort of the Western expansion. It was a population building time here in Michigan as well. And so a lot of these early New York women moved to Michigan and they started talking about these things here. A good example of that is Anna Howard Shaw. She's from Big Rapids. So she started working on temperance work, but then she got involved in suffrage work through that. And she met Susan B. Anthony and she toured the country with her many times. In 1912, Michigan was hopefully going to be one of the first states east of the Mississippi to grant women suffrage. And so she was here crisscrossing the state campaigning and it was an important campaign to her in particular because it was her home state. Clara B. Arthur, she was from Detroit and she was the president of the Michigan Equal Suffrage Association. And under her leadership actually, Michigan uh, permitted women to vote on tax and bond issues. There's Lucia Vorhe Grimes, she was another Detroiter and she created an, a fascinating index card system where um, initially she recorded the views of every person in the Michigan legislature on the, the issue of women's suffrage and they could use this to lobby, um, they recorded other information and this system was so impressive that she was invited to create the same system in Washington DC for all of the US Congress. The fight for women's suffrage was often tied together with another cause. Several of the Michigan women featured here were also abolitionists, fighting to end slavery. So Laura Smith Havlin, she's from Adrian, Michigan. She and her husband were Quakers, and so they didn't believe in the validity of slavery. So she actually helped establish one of the first stops on the, on the Underground Railroad in Michigan, um, right in her home in Adrian. A Sojourner Truth, was the first inductee in the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame in 1983. She had such a well-known presence as an abolitionist and a women's rights advocate. She spent a good portion of her life, particularly the end of her life, just outside of Battle Creek. Sarah Emma Edmonds, she was very active in the Civil War. She was one of the few women that disguised herself as a man. She worked on the battlefields tending wounded soldiers. She was a mail carrier at various times sending messages and then she was also a secret spy. And the list goes on and on. Michigan women from all walks of life and eras in history who made contributions that made the lives of others better. And then there's the woman who was behind this Hall of Fame. Last year we inducted our founder, Dr. Gladys Beckwith, and she certainly uh, was very worthy of this honor. Gladys Beckwith 
um, founded the Michigan Women's Studies Association, our parent organization, in 1973, 40 years ago, on the campus of Michigan State University with other co contemporaries of hers who realized that uh, they should do something to impact what was being taught and thought about Michigan women's history. And we have definitely, over the last four decades, accomplished that goal, but there is a lot more work to do. And we are one of very few states in our country that has a Hall of Fame dedicated to women. So, and ours is 30 years old this year. It's important to know about these women because they have made such great strides in women's rights in every area imaginable. Um, you know, it, there's that saying, if we don't know our history, we're doomed to repeat it, and that's clearly true for women's history. There's always talk about women's roles in politics and families, and none of these are new. Um, and these women struggled with all of those issues already. So it's important to know some of the achievements and, and you know, some of the sacrifices that were made for us to have these rights. We love the saying, you know, if you can see it, you can be it. So perhaps there's a young girl that wants to be, you know, a doctor, but no one in her family's gone to college before. And so that's, you know, some very brave steps right there. But she can come here and she can see other women that were first in their areas and overcame incredible odds and perhaps draw some encouragement to feel that she too can accomplish that. Nominations for the Michigan Women's Hall of Fame are accepted each year until March 21st. To nominate someone for induction or to learn more about Michigan's women's history, visit michiganwomen.org. Next up, we discover a sense of daydream and creativity. Artist Ingrid Taranjo creates cardboard miniature houses and buildings, then photographs them to trick the viewer into thinking they're viewing a real place. To Shepherd we go to introduce you to the imagination of Ingrid as we continue tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. I wanted to be an artist since I was little, since I was like seven, I think. I wanted to be an artist. I went to Central and I got a BFA in painting. And when I got out, I considered myself a painter. I was an oil painter and maybe a watercolor painter, but you know, that was sort of my niche. And when I went to graduate school at Maine College of Art, their program was really different. They didn't want you to, to put yourself in a niche. They wanted you to get out of your comfort zone. They wanted you to just think of yourself as an artist and decide what sort of concept you wanted to bring across and then use whatever media was best for, for that. So that was sort of how I got into three-dimensional work. And I was working with installation. I was very interested in interior space and the idea of, of intimate space. Also these ideas of dream and reverie because of course I was writing my thesis also and I was reading all these philosophers. One of my professors suggested that I work in cardboard and she suggested making miniature houses. At first I was building like these little teeny tiny cardboard houses, you know, which were fun, but I started wanting to photograph the inside of them too and they were so small that I couldn't really get into them so I got bigger and bigger and I sort of got into the dollhouse size. I've just sort of been running with it ever since because I feel like that work is really powerful and I, I, I love that nobody else is really doing it so that it's sort of my own special thing. I try to keep my materials really mundane, just things you can buy in the craft store, things I have lying around my house, like buttons and safety pins and little hinges for little craft projects and beads. Beads work really well for things like shampoo bottles or like I have the studio that I made where I have a little pony bead that's got some like little pieces of wire in it and one of the pieces of wire has the ends are unraveled so it looks like a paintbrush. And, you know, so lots of little teeny tiny details. And I don't know, I just kind of keep working the walls up and decorating until it's done, basically. I'll take the house out into the world and I'll like usually hold it on one hand and hold my camera in this hand. Get it into the window of the house so that I'm viewing the interior of the house and through so you can see the landscape outside and I just try to line it up so the, um, the background is a little out of focus and the interior is in focus and then it looks like it should. 
My process has changed as I've come along. Like I started kind of building Lincoln Log style, like I'd take a board, I'd cut all, all cardboard up into these little boards, and then I'd go all the way around like you're building like a popsicle stick house or something. I've decided maybe that's not the best way. The loft, you know, for instance, it's got large panels of walls and that worked a lot better. And so, I mean, it's a learning, growing experience. I understand that Georgia O'Keeffe didn't become famous until she was about 50, so I think, you know, I've got a little time still. <laughs> you can view more of Ingrid's artwork by checking out her Facebook page, Taranjo.art. Our final stop tonight, has our Bob Garner being a little rascal? Well, that's pretty much an everyday occurrence for Bob, but tonight we'll let him get away with it because he's buying the breadsticks at Spanky's Pizza in Fremont. Spanky's has been serving up the breadsticks and the hospitality for over 20 years, and our little rascal Bob just had to show our gang one of his favorite places to stop. To Fremont we go, to Spanky's, as we wrap up tonight's edition of Destination Michigan. Hey, we're gonna get off the beaten path and we're going to visit a small town. Fremont is the place in Michigan named after a Civil War general explorer and Republican presidential candidate, John Fremont. There is more to this town than you would think. Michelle Burt is a Fremont businesswoman whose breadsticks, very secret recipe breadsticks, are shipped to faraway towns and states. I just had my first bite of your breadsticks. I understand there's a secret to making these that you don't reveal to anyone. Nope. Nobody knows the recipe of the spices in, in the breadsticks. What would it take to, to learn that right now on camera? About $5 million. <laughs> <laughs> and my family's okay. <laughs> and you know, I think, I think that they'd be worth it. But seriously, how did you come up with this idea for, for these breadsticks? Because people come from all around to eat these things. Well, when I was going to college to be a teacher, I worked at a place called Russo's Pizza in Rockford, and we used to make breadsticks, but we only made about eight a week. They weren't spectacular, and I was only about 20 years old, and we ran out of the garlic butter, and I said, Sal, he was the owner, said, I don't know how to make the garlic butter. We're out of garlic butter. Can you make some? Oh, just throw a little this, little that in there, and, and I said, really, I don't know what I'm doing, and he says, just try it. And I tried it and I wrote down what I did but I never told them and then eventually uh, when I get the chance to come up here and get into a business called Joe Mario's um, I just kept working the recipe and working it and working it and I think it was finally perfected about 12 years ago when we decided to buy some conveyor belt ovens that bake them to perfection and they're like snowflakes. Every one of them is different. They're handmade every time, every day, fresh every day. You're now in the frozen breadstick business. Yes. Okay, so tell me about that. Where'd you come up with that idea? Customers. We like to listen to what the customers want, and a lot of customers were asking for a breadstick that they could take home and finish baking at home. If they live 30 minutes or more away, they didn't want them to be kind of cooled down and they wanted to get them hot and fresh out of the oven so finally took the time to figure it out and do it right and we started that in February and kicked it off over the first weekend we kicked it off I advertised it on Facebook we have about 5,400 fans on our Facebook page and uh, I put it on there and we sold almost 200 orders that first weekend of frozen breadsticks of frozen breadsticks, frozen breadsticks. For more information on Fremont, you can visit cityoffremont.net. And for more information on Spanky's famous breadsticks, visit spanky's-pizza.com. Well, that's a wrap on tonight's edition of Destination Michigan, but join us again next time for another edition of Destination Michigan.